If you are still vilifying your ex, pathologizing them, hoping for them to change, psychoanalyzing them, you are still in a relationship with your ex. Mm. How do we get over breakups? Breakups <laughs> are hard. We all go through them. How do we most effectively and efficiently get through them? Yeah. So I think the very first thing is to understand that when you break your heart, you need to look at it as if you broke your leg. If you break your leg, you know, you go to the doctor, you put on a cast, you're not going to run a marathon. But when it comes to breakups in North America, there's this idea of you just get over it. And it just happened for a reason, which is all really bad advice. And there is a, there are different stages of grieving a breakup that are similar to grieving a death. Um, and you need to go through every single stage. That's really how you complete the cycle of healing a breakup. And then you can launch into the next person or relationship. Now, there's seven distinct stages and they're not linear and you can bounce back and forth. The first stage is shock. And it's going to require a very different strategy in shock than you would in another stage. Shock is your body's way of protecting itself so that the new reality is not too overwhelming. You then go into denial where you're like, you know, wait, maybe it wasn't so bad. I can do this again. And you might contact your ex. Then depression, which is reality sets in. You're like, oh, my God, it's done. And then it goes into anger, which in the breakup stages is, is actually a good thing because it shows that energy is moving. It launches you out of depression. It helps you get proactive about making changes, maybe drawing boundaries, and then what happens is another stage called bargaining, very similar to denial. But this is when that acute pain starts to subside and you're like, well, you know, maybe it wasn't so bad. Or maybe if we just did it this way, the relationship can be OK. And this is when I see people cycle back and forth and get back together with their ex a few times until they realize, like, no, this is this is done. The next is accountability. And the conversation really shifts from they did this or they need to give me closure or whatever. It's it's very they focused to me focused. OK, what was my part in this? How can I be accountable and what can I do? And the final stage is acceptance, where you recognize the relationship is over. You're rooted in reality. It doesn't mean that you're not sad or you might not miss the person, but you are uh, putting your energy in taking steps to move forward. Wow. Where, which is the phase where I feel like I, I heard it somewhere in there, but where the brain edits out all the bad stuff and all you remember is the montage of the good stuff? I would say denial and bargaining. Mm. Yeah. And this is so a strategy for that, because I see this often, is there's this the pain is so overwhelming that it's trying to protect itself. So it puts your ex on a pedestal and you need to knock them off. Wow. <laughs> and so at this time, when you notice yourself doing this, it's very helpful to actually in your phone, put a notes in the notes section, write down a list of all the reasons why it didn't work out and why they're not a suitable partner for you. And when you get that urge to try to contact them, review that list. And withdrawal is a very big thing that happens, right? When you're with someone, you have neural pathways that have been wired together. But if you continuously check their social media, look at old text messages, you're not allowing those old neural pathways to prune away. So you really want to have no contact. And I would say a, a minimum of 60 days. So what you want to do, though, right, like you're going to go through withdrawal symptoms. They've done scans on the brain of newly separated people. The brain is activated the same parts of, as a drug user feeding for their next fix. So literally you're in withdrawal. Think of your ex like they're, drug deal like you're, they're your drug dealer. Wow. <laughs> and how you handle that is the there'll typically be something that triggers this withdrawal feeling of panic and anxiety. It might be boredom, might be loneliness. Figure out what that is so you can set up your situation for success. And the second thing is on average that intense feeling of withdrawal lasts between 20 to 30 minutes. So if you can find a way to distract yourself in a healthy way, doing a state change, going for a jog, calling a friend for those 20 to 30 minutes, that's going to be the hardest part. And then you're kind of in the clear a bit more after that. Wow. Do, do men and women deal with these different, these experiences differently? Yeah, they do. So both in the research and what I found working with people after breakups is men generally have more of a tendency to try to suppress, avoid, or distract their feelings. 
So instead of going through the different stages, they're like, no, nope, I'm going to launch right into getting back on the apps, dating someone else, launching into another relationship. And what happens is the pain doesn't just go away, right? Um, and time doesn't heal the wounds. Right. Um, they just, you know, they follow you. So this is where you see the baggage happens. And the, the what I found with working with men is it hits them later. So it hits them either they're in their next relationship and they're doing certain things that are sabotaging or it hits them in regret. Um, but they have a more of a delayed reaction to the pain, whereas the women will typically, they're meeting their friends, they're talking it out, they're journaling, they're doing all the self-care things. And so the women tend to be able to feel it really intensely in the beginning, but when they get over it, they get over it. Wow. Yeah. I've totally experienced that uh, personally. Well, and it was also different when I was like younger versus now. Mm. Like, I feel like when I was younger, I was very quick to when I experienced a breakup, um, plunge myself right back into like the dating world, mm -hmm. had to find a rebound. Right. And, uh, and now these days I feel like, um, I am not as inclined to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a lot more, I think, inclined to sit with like the emotions, whatever it is that I'm feeling. Yeah. It's very super, woke of you. Very woke. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, uh, well, I mean, I've, I've also like over the past year, I've been seeing a therapist mm -hmm. and cause I, I personally, um, have struggled with, with this, with like a, with a breakup. Okay. Um, and it's not that I've had many breakups. I, there was one person in my life who I was with for a very long time on and off. Okay. And it finally became like fully off Okay. about two years ago. Okay. But it's still something that I feel like I'm, uh, you know, dealing with and trying to come to terms with and, and. Uh, I know I, I've listened to one of your appearances on a previous podcast and you talk about the, the fact that closure is bullshit kind right. of, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, there have been many sort of breakups and, and I've dated people, um, other people intermittently. And so it's, it's definitely something that I'm, that I'm familiar with. And, uh, it does somehow, I think get, get easier over time. And it also depends on the, on the nature of the relationship. Mm -hmm. Like, is there a difference in terms of how one experiences a breakup when it's perhaps a, a shorter term relationship versus a longer term relationship? Yeah, so I will work with people who they've been married for 20 years and they get a divorce and then the relationship after that was only six months hmm. and the six month relationship rocks them and they're like, what's wrong with me? I didn't grieve like this after 20 years of marriage. And what I've found is that when there is a lot of intensity in the relationship and the on again, off again, the the pain afterwards is very acute. And so I use this analogy of it like, it's like going to Disneyland. And so say you go to Disneyland and you're super excited and you go on the first couple of rides and you're like, this is amazing. And then um, an hour in, they're like, you know what? Park's closed, gotta go home, right? Versus the 20 year marriage is like, you're going to Disneyland, you've been there for nine hours, you've been through everything, <laughs> your, your, feet hurt. Your, your feet hurt, you got sunburned, you can't have another snow cone, and then you're done. And then after that, you're like, oh, okay, right? But you, but with the first scenario, right, that's like the three month, six month relationship, you are cutting it off on a high. Mm. And not only a high, there's so much possibility of future and hope that has not happened yet. In a 20 year marriage, the future and hope is pretty much done. There's a routine, you know, there's stability, you know what you're going to get. So it's a very different type of pain. Um, and so I don't discredit the person who has been in a relationship for three, six months and it was really intense and it was passionate, romantic. You're also ending a relationship at the peak of love drugs, right? We know that there's two major stages of, of relationships, right? The beginning stage, which is the passionate stage, usually it's a year to two years. The chemicals are very different. It's very dopamine driven and dopamine is a molecule of more. It motivates you to get more of whatever feels good. And so you find that after one to two years, the chemicals change and it goes into the more companionate stage of love. It becomes a lot more peaceful. There, it's less dopamine based. It's more oxytocin. They hear now chemicals, and and so the the longer relationships, the intensity, the motivation to get more, it's 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 less and it's different. Hmm. Very interesting. Why do people? I mean, I was in an on and off again relationship for a very long time, like 
15 years. Mm. And I loved this this person very much. And the and the love was like mutual. It was like mm-hmm. we 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 but we we were not able to like make it work. And I think like looking back it's you know we we kind of drug each other through youth and the hormones and the drinking and the partying and everything that you know changing cities and and there was a lot that we mm-hmm. experienced together. A lot of like trauma bonding also. Yeah. Why do I mean I'm sure it's different for every relationship, but the on and off again thing. Mm. What's the deal with that? I mean, what if if there's an innate sense that the relationship doesn't work, why is it still so enticing to to have that sort of like um, oscillating, yeah. chaotic, cha- you know, chaos in the relationship? I would say there's two parts to this answer. The first is sunk cost fallacy, which is usually a term used more in economics, right? It's it's this. It explains this cognitive. Um, distortion, this thinking error that humans are privy to making, where we put good money into a bad deal. And it's usually used in the stock market, but we do this the same, right? Whether it's watching a movie, you buy a ticket for a movie, it sucks in the first 15 minutes, but you're like, you know what, I already paid for it. I'm going to watch the whole thing. Also happens with relationships. I've already spent five years of on again, off again therapy, trying all these ways of like making it work, investment, vacations to Maui. And because of that, we keep focusing on what we've already invested versus the real question to ask yourself is, okay, I can never recruit what I invested. That's reality. So if I was going to start right now, knowing what I know, and that this person is not going to change, um, would I make the same decision? And you want to focus on present value and future value which is instead of getting caught up in the past. And so that's number one. Number two is there's something called intermittent reinforcement. And they've done studies on rats where they put rats in a cage and there's a lever. And every time the rat pressed a lever, they'd get a pellet of food. And then the... They looked at what the rats did. Yep, they understand that's continuous reinforcement. Then the scientists were like, well, what happens if we took away the pellet of food sometimes, but sometimes we gave it. Hmm. So the rat would press a lever and they had no idea if they were going to get the reward or not. And what they found with these rats were they got completely maniacally obsessed with pressing the lever. Wow. They stopped grooming themselves. They stopped drinking water. Some of them died. And... You know, the same way of thinking happens with why the slot machines are the most popular at a casino, right? Most profitable, because whether you are that rat pressing the lever or you are that gambler hoping for that ding, 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 or you are that person hoping that maybe they're going to slide into your DMs again or show up and ask you for a date, it's the same thing. It's intermittent reinforcement, and that makes us addicted. And we don't understand that. So we think, no, 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 it's person so awesome. It's so amazing. That's why I feel this. But it's because your brain, um, it doesn't know when the reward is going to come. And when you do get something, whatever it is, a little crumb, um, the amount of dopamine is more. There's a lot more intensity. And if you pair, if you pair that with absence afterwards or abuse or criticism, then you have these high peaks and lows and that gets you addicted to the person. Wow. That's mind blowing. So it's the uncertainty. It's the randomness. The randomness. So the unpredictable rewards. Wow. <laughs> what about, I mean, you know, cause like I think over the years I've realized that I think when you're younger, it's a lot more enticing to want to pin all of the problems in the relationship on the other person. Mm-hmm. Like it's her fault or it's his fault yeah. or, or, or what have you. And I think as I've gotten older and like, you know, seen a therapist and I've realized that I'm not perfect. Like Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, this is like part of the realization, I think that you only get with, with time to some degree, but, uh, but yeah, like a lot of the problems in the relationship were were from me, were the Mm -hmm. fact that I had like undealt with trauma, Mm -hmm. which is, I kind of feel like it's a little bit of imposter syndrome saying that I have trauma because I grew up pretty privileged. Mm -hmm. Um, like I didn't have, there was not one explicit event, but Mm -hmm. I think we all have like from childhood for sure traumas Yeah, and Again, I know people have like real stuff, you know, like um, sexual trauma and stuff like that. I think the I think the term is complex PTSD. Is that is that does that ring a bell? Yeah. And there's there's big T trauma and little T trauma, right? Big T is like that huge event. Yeah. Uh, Little T trauma are those little things, right? It could it, it doesn't mean that you have bad parents, right? It could be that they were misattuned to your needs. Um, And that's when we get into attachment styles, right? Mm. Like there's anxiously attached um, people who as children, 
it's not that their parents were evil, but sometimes when the child's crying or needs something, the parent is there, sometimes they're not. So what happens is their nervous system is actually wired differently because they don't ever know if they're going to get their needs met. So they grow up to be very hyper vigilant to cues that their safety or connection is is in jeopardy. Um, they get a lot of anxiety. Um, they panic. They, they're easier to startle. Whereas someone who is more avoidantly attached as children, um, the parent could have been controlling, could have not been attuned to their needs at all. And at a very young age, like when you're a toddler, before you can even speak, you realize like, oh, I need to get my needs met my own way. So I'm going to get really good at self-soothing and being very, very independent. And these care, they follow you along into, into your adult relationships where your primary caregiver connection moves on to your romantic connection. And these things play out. And avoidantly attached people are typically drawn to anxious and vice versa. So yeah, our childhood things, it doesn't mean that terrible things have happened to you, but it could have even been like, oh, I wasn't picked on that sports team. And you you had this belief like, oh, I'm not chosen. And as an adult, you forget the memory, but something is in you where you're like, I'm not chosen. I'm not chosen. I don't understand why this is. Yeah, I'm definitely avoidant. Mm. I've, I've learned. Are these are these like attachment styles, these, this this terminology, this verbiage, like, is it, is it, how, like, is it helpful or hurtful to have a label that we then ascribe to, right? Because then doesn't it create like a, a narrative that can that can become self-perpetuating? I think that's such a great point you made. I think it's helpful when you use it as a framework to understand yourself better and the partner you have or the partners you might have. It is very unhelpful when you use that as a way to vilify someone. Or to use it as an excuse. Yeah. Or like, I'm just an avoidant. Like, I'm like this. And so, yeah, I think it like with any any sort of tool or framework, it is really up to how are you using it? Yeah, I've learned that. So I, I, I've, I was always very close with my mother, mm-hmm. um, which I think is common among like in Jewish families, like especially the older son, like you've got a really tight relationship with, with the mother and the stereotype is like overbearing, like very protective mm-hmm. mom. Right. And everybody knows, like, because I've been very public, like I've like love my mom. Mm-hmm. Um, she was a great parent. But one of the things that I learned about in therapy uh, or that was sort of uh, identified via this this talk therapy process and like going through like the issue, the problems that I've had with with like past relationships, particularly this long term on and off again relationship, is that my mom leaned on me probably a little too much as a child emotionally Mm -hmm. my mom and dad were both independently wonderful parents and they stayed together for a long time for the for the sake of the children and the business that they ran but but my but the the, their relationship was not great and so my mom would then kind of use me as a Mm stand-in you know she was I, i think at times emotionally needy right and would use me in place of a partner. So what that's called, and I think the term sounds a lot more, it sounds a lot worse than, than it is, but it's, it's, it's essentially called covert incest. Mm. Um, and so that I think has possibly created this like avoidant attachment in me. The fact that I still kind of have this like bond with my mom Mm -hmm. has made it difficult for me to bond with other women. Yeah. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I had, there was always this feeling that I had with my ex-girlfriend that I couldn't really be without her. I loved her, but I also couldn't be with her. Like mm-hmm. I couldn't commit to her. Yeah. Yeah. I, we've seen that before with people who tend to be more avoidant. Uh, another term is called an enmeshment where mm. instead of being a child, which is just a child, you take on the role of therapist savior, provider, father, mother, whatever it is. Um, And again, it's not because you had, you know, bad intention parents, but what that causes is on a very subconscious level, that intimacy is going to equal um, pressure, control, responsibility, all these things. And it's so deeply ingrained that there's an association that love is going to do this to me. So when someone gets a little bit too close, it's not like you can't be in a relationship. There's always an emotional distance. Yeah. Is it ever, I mean, because you you do this professionally now, you coach people through your, your you know, breakup boot camps. 
does getting like does getting back with an ex ever work? And I'm not asking for myself, like, but in general, people have on and off relationships. There's there's you know this uh, dogma. It seems like that like it just it it never works. Maybe it's like wisdom that's been tested through the ages. Maybe maybe it does work in circum certain circumstances. But yeah. is it is it always a bad idea? Is it sometimes a good idea? I have two answers. So according to the research, um, research shows that uh, people that get back together, not right away, but after through time, hmm. they actually have more chances of success in staying together. Interesting. So, but in what I've seen firsthand is after a breakup and there hasn't been much time that's transpired uh, and they're really going back because like they miss each other or the withdrawal and nothing has really changed. They just play out the same emotional experiences and patterns again and again until they finally explode. Wow. One of the things that, I, that I've heard you talk about that um, I, it's a concept that I love is the, 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 con, the cognitive distortions mm. that we are prone to making, um, particularly in the, in the setting of the breakup. Yeah. Um, catastrophizing, mm -hmm. black or white thinking. Can you expound a little bit? Yeah. On these? So one of the first activities we do at Breakup Bootcamp is we have people write their relationship story. And I think whether you're going through a breakup or you're single, you can still do this. What is your story about relationships? As if you were having a glass of wine, talking to your friend, everything from your beliefs, like whether it's it's too hard to date in L.A. or my ex is such a narcissist, whatever it is, you write it down unfiltered. And then you look at the list of d the different cognitive distortions, which are really um ways, exaggerated ways of thinking that are not rooted in reality and amplify stress and anxiety. And some of the main ones, right? All or nothing thinking is one. Um, when you say things and you can catch it in your language, this always happens to me. I never, blah, 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 <laughs> right? Um, or should statements where I should have done that. He should have done this. Um, mind reading, fortune telling, catastrophizing, all of these are a list of the common thinking traps that all human beings are privy to. But once you're aware of that, you then go back to your relationship story and you circle all of the cognitive distortions. And you will see there's typically two to three that are your go-to ones. Mm. And this is going to come up not just in your romantic relationships, but in life. Then you rewrite your story with only the facts. You take away your assumptions, you take away the cognitive distortions, you take away the fiction, and then you have a story that's rooted in reality. And when it comes to healing the heart and with breakups, we cannot make any steps forward if you're not rooted in reality, if you're still fantasy-based. Um, so I think that's a really helpful thing to do. Um, and also, you know, the vilifying the ex. This is where I see it a lot. There is a story, like you mentioned, this blame of they did this, they did that. But look, if you are still vilifying your ex, pathologizing them, hoping for them to change, psychoanalyzing them, you are still in a relationship with your ex. Mm. You're just in a relationship who's not in a relationship with you. And this can go on for years, if not decades. Wow. You're allowing them to live rent free in your ha in your in your ha brain, pretty much. Exactly. I'm prone to my assistant Sydney said that I'm I catastrophize. Okay. Yeah, I do it in work. Okay. Uh, sometimes, and then, but also like in the in the in the setting of the relationship, which how does that look typically for when people do it? It's like I'm never gonna find. Yeah, like uh, it's always everyone thinks they're too old to find love. I've talked to people who are 24 and they're going through, you know, I'm 24 and like, it's over. Like I'm never going to find love to 35, 45, 55, 65. Um, and so that's, that's one thing, but I'm curious for you, since you're aware of that, you do that. What do you do to, to kind of mind hack it? Well, I try to, um, I try to catch myself when I'm speaking in like absolutes yeah. and, and hyperbole, mm -hmm. you know, like, Oh, it's always that way, or it's never like that, or um, this always happens. Mm -hmm. Nothing always happens right. a certain way, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, in in relationships, what I what I remember was, and I think this is common, is I would think um, about you know the person that, that I was with, and I would say, oh, she's always like this, which she's not. She wasn't never always anyway. You know, she was like she. She's a dynamic human being. That's there, you know. People um, contain multitudes, right? And but then also on the receiving end, I would always get fr I would get frustrated when she would say, "You 
never mm-hmm. uh, do so and so, or you never. I mean, I'm I'm drawing a blank now because it's been such a long time. But like, but yeah, it's like hi- that hyperbolic language, both with others and with ourselves, mm-hmm. seldom productive. Yeah, and so I think your little hack does work, right? The very first thing is catching it, and then go like, then you can go like, oh that's a thinking trap. That's just my mind trying to pull me that way. And then you, you correct it. So like when I do the all, always nothing, never as well. And I'll be like, oh, actually I, I'm saying always, but it was actually uh, September 15th happened once and then October twice. Okay. So two times. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, okay. And that, it actually really does help you for the future and set you up um, where it comes a little bit more naturally the next time. How did you, uh, I'm curious, like your personal story, how did you come to become such an expert in, uh, in this topic? Just constantly being heartbroken. I swear. Like (laughs) I, I swear, I thought I've been like, I was born with a broken heart. I just struggled with love so much. And so I, I studied it. I was like, if I can understand the science and research behind it, then maybe I wouldn't get dumped all the time. And I became a dating columnist first. And, um, in my late twenties, I was in a relationship and I, I was like, I'm living the dream. Like, you know, that the, we dated, we moved in together. We talked about marriage and having kids and, um, he was an entrepreneur. So I would just write on the side for fun. I'm like, it's all set. And then that relationship fell apart, um, due to infidelity. And I put so much of my identity in him and us and our future that I fell apart. And it was really, really dark. Um, I, I fell into depression. I had suicidal thoughts and I couldn't understand what was wrong with me because as a overachieving person, I'm used to, you do the thing you get, you do A, you get B and you know, it was like, but with this, nothing I was doing was working and the darkness was really scary. So when I healed from that, and I would say it actually took two and a half years to fully like for the bitterness to, to leave me. Um, I was like, what happens to those people who don't have a support system, who don't know what books, who don't know what tools, like what happens to them? Because we are all a few bad decisions away from doing something completely destructive when we don't feel like we have hope. Mm. And so I was like, I need to create this place where people can come. It's in nature. They have food like that's nutritious because you typically don't want to eat after a breakup. And you are getting expert advice from people who know what they're doing, not telling you these things like, it happened for a reason, you can do better. Like, and and you leave differently. So you leave understanding, okay, these are the tools when I feel anxiety, this is how I can heal, to provide them a pro- positive momentum for healing. And that's how Breakup Bootcamp was born. Wow. Is it, people break up for different reasons. Like they break up, like infidelity you mentioned. Is the, is the, is the grieving and healing process different? Um, Cause uh, I mean, I guess, we could talk about like this, no, this notion of closure, right? Mm. Like, is it, is it different when you break up due to maybe the relationship co- taking its course or something like an, like an inciting incident, like infidelity, which is a, which is a big thing. Um, how does that sort of modulate how, you know, the, the, the wake? Yeah. So the pain is very unique and I find that people tend to look at pain like it's a competition. So like, well, other people have had harder things than me. Mm. Um, So the person who had a breakup um, because one had to move to another, another continent or whatnot, they're like, well, I shouldn't feel that because it was a good relationship. And like that person had infidelity, but your pain is unique. And it also how hard it hits you also depends on you. And if you veer more anxiously attached, you will take the breakup the hardest because you put so much of your identity in the validation of your relationship and your sense of safety is connected to the relationship. And so um, I think it's more about how hard are you going to take the breakup depends a lot on your attachment style. It also depends on on your support system in life, right? If everything is going well for you and you go through a breakup and you have a support system, very different than it's the beginning of the pandemic, you lost your job, you're not seeing anyone. So all these things are, are part of it. And even the person who's doing the breakup, very different. You're not dealing with rejection, but then you're dealing with guilt and, and seeing someone that you love feel hurt. And that's a very different type of pain too. Yeah, wow. So are you... Um you and your your ex the one that that like that relationship yeah. that led to this journey for you how did that 
unfold over time? Are you guys? We're really good friends. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just saw him for coffee like two weeks ago. So you can become friends with an ex? You can. Um, I don't I don't recommend it right away. People who try to become friends right away, they're not grounded in reality because you can't go from an intimate relationship to platonic without a transition period. Hmm. And again, like your chemicals are recalibrating, your neural pathways need to prune away. And what I find is it's usually the person who's doing the breaking up wants to stay friends because they get the emotional connection or sometimes the boyfriend experience or the girlfriend experience without the responsibility of the commitment. And so um, I think there needs to be a period of time that passes. And also not everyone deserves a place in your life, <laughs> right? There might be someone, not that they're a terrible person or they're a villain, but maybe they just don't add anything to your life. So there's no point of being their friend. I have I have exes that I'm just not friends with because I'm like, you're actually not that awesome. I don't want you part of my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe you met them. Uh, there's this whole thing with like birth control. Like you, um, women who are on birth control, they're attracted to a certain type of guy yeah. that they s cease to be attracted to once they get off the birth control. Oh, that's so crazy. Yeah. We did a podcast with uh, Sarah Hall, researcher um, on that. that. That whole topic is like, is super interesting. I have a friend who's convinced that um, when we are intimate with somebody, we share microbes, mm. you know, the, the, the cross transfer of microbes via the microbiome. Mm -hmm. And that creates cr that where it, it, it at least plays a role in the craving that we feel for that person in those early, mm. in those early months. Well, there's definitely when you're having sex and having orgasm, um, you, there's chemicals at play, right. And men and women um, have different chemicals. And so after an orgasm, a man will release a lot more testosterone, right? Um, less vasopressin, which is a bonding, whereas women will release a lot of oxytocin. And oxytocin is a bonding uh, hormone. So, it, you know, we secrete it when we breastfeed, when we give birth. And that's why there's some people that say that uh, women will feel a little bit more attached or more bonded after after sex. And I know, like, like look, if you want to have you know, lots of sex, totally fine. You do you. I know for myself, like I, when I watched Sex in the City, I was like, oh, I'm, I can be like Samantha. Like <laughs> I'm going to go around New York and do this. And I found that it didn't matter who the person was. Like if they were, I don't know, homeless, whether they're picking up garbage, whether, whatever it was, I would be so attached. I'm like, oh my God, I love you. And for me, I was like, it just doesn't work for me because I knew that if I had sex with someone, I would get instantly bonded. So you have to kind of figure out what works for you. Yeah. So there is like a biological double double standard. Men and women are not created equally. In terms of the the chemicals, very different experiences. Yeah, I I agree. Talk talk about what is happening at the beginning of a relationship. Like mm -hmm. when you when you first. Well, I guess let's take it even like before the uh, when you know the the crystallization of a relationship. Dating. Like what what what's happening? Like what should we look out for? when trying to assess the ideal suitor. I've heard you talk a lot about how chemistry can actually be deceiving. Right. Um, and yet it's something that we all look for. Yeah. We all want 10 out of 10 chemistry right away. Right. right? It's but, usually like wounding patterns. So like, look, there's something called attractions deprivation. Um, Ken Page is a really good doctor who talks about this. And it explains how we're drawn to people who can wound us in a very familiar way wow. to how we were wounded as children. And our psyche on a subconscious level tries to recreate the scenario of the crime in an attempt to change its ending. And um, and so we human beings were drawn to what's familiar. And this is across the board, whether it's food, music, or, or people. And this sense of home we feel when we lock eyes across a bar with this person. We're like, oh, I just feel it. And you end up, you know, thinking you found the one and then it just ends up in an explosion over and over again. I know I've met the one 27 times. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but if you have a history of dating and choosing people that aren't healthy for you, that aren't the right fit, this could be a sign that um, these are attractions of deprivation. And I call this in my book, um, your chemistry compass, which is our internal GPS that, that points us into the direction of who we're drawn to and who we're repulsed by. And especially if you didn't have a healthy model of what love looks like and feels like growing up, your sense of familiar, familiarity could be chaos or unavailability. I know like that was me, right? Very busy immigrant father, entrepreneur. I got um, at 
$40 if I got an A, but I, that was it. I never got attention or anything else. And so growing up, I would be drawn to people who I constantly had to chase, pine, edit myself, be very like a good girl, submissive, because those were the ways I was rewarded. And it wasn't until I really dug into the pattern. I was like, oh, like this is the same emotional experience playing out over and over again. And those people I get that 10 out of 10 attraction to, it's the same thing. It's actually not healthy. Wow. And there are different, de different kinds of chemistry, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So I really recommend to people when they're dating, um, I, I have this thing called, um, the dating funnel. And it really looks like a sales funnel. On the top of it is prospecting, which is your lead generation. And then it goes into discovery, which is dates one to three, and then evaluation, which is like dates three to 20, 30, and then close. And so dates one to three, all you want to do is don't be like, are they my future like baby daddy? Like any of that stuff. Like that energy comes into it and there's a sense of pressure or conquesting vibes. And it's not, it's not sexy. So dates one to three is just, is there a base connection? Because sometimes the brain cognitively takes some time to process what type of connection that is. Is it romantic, platonic, whatever? Um, you just want to see, am I having fun? Do I want to see this person again? If you want to see someone again, that means that there is dopamine because that's motivating you to want to see them again. And, and if you do, then it warrants another date. But we put way too much pressure in the very beginning. And again, where you are in the dating funnel requires a different strategy. Um, so yeah, <laughs> but this is like, it's counterintuitive because normally it's like, we want, we see 10 out of 10 chemistry as being the ideal, but you're saying that could actually be a red flag. Yes. And if the chemistry is five out of 10, mm -hmm. you're saying don't write that off. Yes. I say under five. So I actually have a rating. I have a worksheet for people. <laughs> and you have to rate on, on terms of the sense of connection. So if it's five and below, I would say no. Uh, if it's ever discussed, it's an absolute no because we don't bounce back from disgust. Um, but there is something called the the mere exposure effect where being around someone more frequently will actually amplify whatever was the base feeling. So if it was disgust or annoyance, it will just amplify that. But if there was a sense of connection, it will amplify that. And so sometimes for some people, especially if they're not the charismatic, like they're, they're not so good at dating, um, it might be a five, but then through time you see their values, their character, their consistency, and that can grow. And we really do ourselves a disservice by just discounting all the people that aren't like this, oh my God, I want to rip your clothes off. And again, <laughs> like uh, often that's a, it's a red flag versus a green light. Wow. Is, is a certain type of chemistry more indicative of a, of a red flag than others? For example, like if you have really powerful initial sexual chemistry? No, I don't think so. I think you need to look at your history because if you, you know, after working through some of these like primary wounds and getting healthier and more secure, um, your intuition becomes very on point. And that's really the goal is to get your chemistry compass fixed hmm. <laughs> so that when it is pointing to someone, it's actually not like ding, 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 that can wound you just like your dad did. It's like, oh, this is a healthy person. <laughs> so yeah, I think it really is dependent on you. Wow. I, yeah, I mean, I struggle with, with that. Like I, I, you know, I do look for the 10 out of 10. Um, I, I look for that. I look for the familiarity. Mm -hmm. I look for the 10 out of 10 chemistry, the, the attraction. Um, like I feel like with my, X, I mean, what took, and I'm, and I'm coming out of it. Like, I feel like I'm, if I'm not already out of it, but I do feel like one of the, one of the issues was that I felt like we were molecularly bonded, like mm -hmm. on such a deep level. I mean, you've talked about the wiring of, of neurons, you know, like neural pathways, um, but also like the aesthetic, like I'm a, I personally like something that, that um, I've had to unwind is that I'm a very aesthetically sensitive person. Mm -hmm. Like I love. So movies. you like hot girls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aesthetically <laughs> conscious, woke language for, I like babes. <laughs> well, <laughs> that perhaps, but it's not just that. It's inclusive of that, but <laughs> I'm inclusive. <laughs> um, I'm getting good at the, at the woke language. Uh, no, it's that, 
it's that my brain, like, you know, I, I lo- I'm a big movie buff and music buff. So my brain actually cuts montages. Like when you watch a movie and there's like, you know, have you ever seen Vanilla Sky, the montage yes. with like Sophia and David Ames, like the montages they would cut against the Vanilla Sky with the with the right pop song playing. Like for me, that's sort of like I, I have these like montage reels, these highlight reels mm-hmm. of of past relationships and like under the covers and and on the beach. And it's just like. And, and with and and the music and whatever, and it's just very hard to um, to they're very powerful. Like they're they're strong. Uh, you know, it's like an aesthetic thing. For yeah, me. yeah. I mean, look, it's intoxicating, right? And your version of the Vanilla Sky montage is probably my version of growing up watching Little Mermaid and Sex in the City and wanting Mr. Big or that Prince Mermaid dude to come save me. We all have been bombarded with messages, love songs, movies that we love that build our ideas of what love and relationship are supposed to be. And I think that's why we are sorely disappointed. And um, I think this is very prevalent in North America. And if it's a strategy that works for you, fuck keep going. But if it's not, and think about what is it that you actually want? Because our dating strategies in our 20s, right? We want fun. We want novelty. We want exciting, hot, 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 right? <laughs> um, I'm like, oh, they don't wear that brown of skinny jeans? No. <laughs> but like if when you're in a different stage of life and maybe you're thinking like, I want to meet someone where I could build a family with, where we can co-create together. We, we could be each other's rocks. The dating strategy needs to be updated from what you used in your 20s. And so being more realistic with what is partnership, and it's not, right? Like the beginning stage of a relationship, the first one to six months, that's booster mode. You are, it's a love chemical cocktail. And I hear this a lot where women complain like, well, you know, in the beginning he was like initiating dates and he would make the reservations. And like now, like, you know, he's hardly making an effort. And I'm like, you don't know the person until you pass the booster mode stage. Because in the beginning, even if you're avoidantly attached, um, you are motivated to because you're because of the dopamine so you're in like this mode of like courtship but that doesn't mean that nine months later when that heavy dopamine isn't there that you're still going to have that motivation and it levels out and then you see how someone actually is in a relationship or partnership so the evaluation stage actually is data collection and you can only know this through seeing someone through time and also not through the good times. You don't really know someone until you see them in how do they handle stress? Mm. How do they handle conflict? Um, And so I think we need to stop having this idea of like the soulmate, the one, this like, oh my God, the first like three months. Um, It doesn't set precedent on how a partnership is actually going to be. Wow. How do we upgrade our dating criteria? (laughs) (laughs) Mine hasn't changed. So here's (laughs) 20 years. Something helpful for you. (laughs) is you want to be ma- optimizing for the right things in terms of wanting, if if it is a partnership that you want. And from what I understand, you're not just looking for like a two month tryst. Like you're like, I want a yeah. relationship. Okay. I actually, I'm being, <laughs> I'm catching myself being hyperbolic. It has changed, but it ha- it's changed in some ways and it hasn't changed in other ways. Okay. So if, if it is like a committed relationship you're looking for, um, there's four pillars. So look at it like you're building a house and under there's like the foundation. There's four pillars. The very first pillar is there has to be some sort of chemistry and connection. Okay. We know that easy. The next pillar is timing. If it is a perfect person at the wrong time, it is the wrong person right now. Hmm. The third is compatibility. And this is comprised of an alignment of values and vision. So if you're like, I really want to have children and someone's like, I'm absolutely against children, that's not going to work. If you really value honesty, generosity, and you're with someone who's super cheap, um, who like, you know, is too uncomfortable talking about the, telling the truth so they never do it, that that is the glue. And past the romance stage, the relationship will fall apart. The fourth pillar, which... Um, a lot of people tend to overlook or rationalize away is mutuality. You need two people who are equally invested in building. And I don't mean just intention. A lot of people are like, I want a relationship. Great, intention's there. But do you have the capacity and do you have the ability? And sometimes people don't have the ability. Hmm. They might have a lot of 
baggage or trauma and they refuse to see that there's anything wrong or that they're accountable. They don't want to do anything about it. It's all your fault. They actually don't have the ability or the capacity and you need all four. If you don't have one of the pillars, you're just, your foundation is on very shaky ground. I feel like there's a, I live in Los Angeles. A lot of people, especially on this side of town, are unable to have relationships. Whether or not they project on social media that that's what they want, mm-hmm. they're un, they're literally unable to. Yeah. There's a lot of like narcissism mm-hmm. in this town. There's a lot of uh, egoic need for validation, whether it's via social media yeah. or uh, the careers. You know, there's a lot of like people in the in the entertainment business here. So um, very self selected uh, group of of egocentric centric people. Um, what are some tools? I don't know these days that, that, uh, you find to be effective for, um, for a narcissist, <laughs> for a narcissist. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I asked my therapist, I'm like, am I a narcissist? She said, no. So mm-hmm. I feel like I I'm, I'm in the clear there, cool. even though, <laughs> even though I, uh, have like, you know, I may be higher on the continuum of like, you know, of the narcissistic sort of like I don't have a narcissistic personality disorder, right? But like I think I'm a little bit more narcissistic than somebody who's not narcissistic at all. Like I value my, you know, like, like I, you know, I I do care about the way that I look and like the way that I feel, and I feel that my point of view matters, and I love cr- express creatively expressing myself. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we all have narcissistic tendencies. Uh, and it's a spectrum, right? And the NPD being at the extreme side. Um, I think when I'm working with people who are trying to recover from a relationship with someone who's high on the narcissism scale, what what is found is that person who's high on the narcissism has, it's a lack of empathy. Mm. Um, it is using other people to up-level themselves. Um, and they typically target people who will be able to help them either financially or status um, so they usually target very beautiful, um, smart. It's like that guy people. in the documentary. What was that? Uh, the Tinder oh, Swindler? Tinder Swindler's one. Yeah. Bad Vegan was another. Hmm. I haven't um, seen that. I heard it was good. Yeah. Yeah. One of the telltale signs I've heard of dating a narcissist is that you get love bombed yeah. early. What is that? Look, I think love bombing happens even with people who aren't narcissists and it's something to be aware of. So love bombing is this coming in really strong, um, with, Promises of the future, gifts, romantic, like not gifts, a narcissist. The whole thing, um, <laughs> but it, but it's using it as a manipulation tactic. And typically, what happens is um, they will then withdraw, so they'll go cold, or they will then go the other side and like it's like Doctor Jekyll, and Mister Hyde. Then they come in and they're critical and they're controlling, um, and then they cycle between the two. So they create these deep highs and lows, and again, this intensity. And the intermittent reinforcement, and it really hooks people mm. um, under their claws. Wow, <laughs> it's and and it, it creates like an addiction. Yeah, it it, be, it especially because they're usually typically targeting people who are more vulnerable. Um, so there's a session in our boot camp where we talk to the women about how to narcissist proof yourself. Ooh, um, and. Our, our anxiety co- coach, Trish Burles, leads it. And she's like, this is just this badass. She's so confident. And she's like, narcissists hate me. And there's a reason why. Because a narcissist would never be able to get through to her because she will not take your shit. And what they're looking for is if you have this kind of gaping, missing piece of like, I'm not, I need to feel special, um, you are a target because – they are really good at zoning in on you and making you feel like you're the most special person and that out of everyone I could choose, I'm choosing you. And then if you're like, I need to feel special, Woon, you're like, oh my God, they're picking me. I'm so lucky. I need to hop right on this and lock it in. Even though they've gone out with me two times and they told me that I'm the love of their life and they want to lock it down. Okay, sure. Wow. Does that ever work out? Does that ever? No. Wow. I, I, I mean, six years of running this business, I have not seen it work out. Wow. So, because that's interesting because I feel like a lot of girls, probably, especially today in the era of everything is on display on social media, Mm -hmm. probably are being encouraged to want that, right? The guy who's very showy Mm -hmm. with their affections, right? Mm -hmm. The big trips, the, the loud, lavish lifestyle, the notes, the whatever's like Instagrammable, right? Right. Yeah. 
I wonder if I wonder if that's increasing, or if like the, the sort of the, the victimhood of that um, is increasing, be, just because social media tends to create this, tends to amplify narcissism yeah. and exacerbate it. Um, I don't actually have like the stats, but in my business, I've noticed it's increasing. So I would say. 30% of the women that come to break up boot camp are in an on again, off again relationship with a narcissist and they cannot get out. So by the time I have the intake call with them and by the time they come, I don't know if they're still in the relationship. And that number has increased throughout the years. Wow. Yeah. Do you, I mean, you're, you're obviously so brilliant and, and expert in this topic of breakups, but do you also help them create new relationships and, and, and date and like get back out into the world? Yeah. So I, I do. So after the, they're, they're healed from their breakup, they're like, I'm woke. <laughs> um, then I help them with the next part, which is my program called like dating mastery. I'm writing my second book on this. Amazing. And it's really on the, like learning about the dating funnel. And because a lot of people, when they struggle with dating, they're like, I'm just not going to date. I'm like dating fatigue, but it's like, no, like where in the funnel are you actually having a hard time converting? And using specific tools and strategy to help you with conversion rate in that This funnel. is like marketing language that you're applying to dating. But I think it's like effective because when you're dating, you're marketing yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. And I typically work with very practical minded, typically high achieving people. And it's like you don't have to just throw out dating. And people are like, well, I don't like I don't like online dating. I like I don't like the process. But I'm like. Look, no one does. Like, it's just like if you're going to go to Bali, you don't go like, I love packing and getting the visas and going to the airport and going through customs. But you do it because you go to Bali and then you go to the beach, mm. right? Dating is the same thing. You do the things, not because you love it, but because there's a destination that you want to get to. And this is a necessary part of the process. But there are skills that you learn that you can get better at dating. You can get better at learning how to create rapport connection, how to not take things personally, how to expand your range. Um, and something I actually have, I work with people when I, when they're trying to date again is I have them do a dating experiment and they have to date 12 people and they're technically not allowed to get in a relationship with them. Although mo I would say most of them do at around date person eight. And the whole point is you date people you normally would not give a chance to. So I have women who are, who are tall and they're like, I will only date people who are six, two and over. And like, you have to, on your dating experiment, date someone shorter than you. Um, or people only date people at a certain age range. Like, no, I only date people who's 30 to 34. I'm like, no, okay, uh, you're expanding that to 45. And, and what happens is because there isn't the pressure of they need to find the one, they're like, sure, I'll do this as an experiment. They go and then they become pleasantly surprised. Like, oh, like, I really like liked how I felt. Like, oh, that was fun. And I've had many people who end up getting in a relationship with someone during this experiment being like, I'm now with someone I would never have given a chance to. Wow, very interesting. We adapt. Human beings will adapt to these things that we currently optimize for. So um, we optimize typically for looks, uh, money, um, height, but what happens is in the beginning, these things are very, very high priority. Then you get it. And because humans adapt, eventually what happens is that person who's super, super hot or super, super rich, you get used to it. So it's it doesn't it doesn't give you that same high or like wow factor three years, five years, 10 years after you're having kids. It doesn't matter. But what matters are certain things like empathy, kindness, ability to work through conflict ability to make um, tough life decisions together, those are the things that will actually impact your baseline of happiness. Wow, do you have uh, both men and women that you coach with regard to dating? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. I feel like the, the, the online dating is difficult. It's like uh, some people are way better in person than they are online, mm -hmm. uh, but I love the Bali like analogy <laughs> that you used. I, I find online dating to be so tedious. Mm, why? Um, too many hot chicks, <laughs> too many Just <laughs> swimming in them. No, it's like the, um, well, I'm on, I'm on, uh, this, this app called Raya. Mm -hmm. No, no affiliation. Honestly, the only reason why I still have an account is because I've, I was one of the early adopters and, uh, they've since started charging. So I got grandfathered in, I have a free account, but I find that there's like a lot of like window shopping right. on the app and like people don't, yeah, I'm all, I'm, I always feel the pressure to come up with something like really witty. Mm hmm. Um, and I just don't have that kind of time or mental bandwidth to dedicate like to 
a witty opening one-liner, and I feel like a lot of people can relate to that. Mm-hmm. I just want to be like, hey, how's your week or something like that? And I that doesn't really get as many responses as you, as you would hope. Yeah, yeah. But um, but then, I, you know, I've used like Hinge. Mm-hmm. I've had some luck on Hinge. I like meeting people in person too a mm-hmm. lot. Um, it's not, I'm not like desperate for dates or anything, but like it, uh, but you know, I'm still, it's, I think I live in a part of the world, West Hollywood, Los Angeles, that makes it, I think a little bit more difficult than, mm-hmm. than other Maybe parts. you should do, try the dating experiment. The dating experiment? Yeah. Yours? Yeah. Go outside my comfort zone? Yeah. You know, it's so funny. I'm actually, I was helping my friend set up his dating profile and he has been, uh, in open relationships his whole life. And he's like, now he's like, you know what? I, I want to be in a, a monogamous relationship. I want to try it out. I'm like, okay, cool. So he's like showing me girls and he's like, oh, what do you think? What do you think of the, this person? And I'm like, okay. So you say you want to meet someone and have a committed partnership that someone like is your equal, but the person that you're showing me is someone who's every single photo is just screams sex, 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 sex. Right. So I'm like, you say you want one thing. That's what, what I want. What you're actually doing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I should show, I I should give you that profile. (laughs) So I was like, like, like you say you want one thing, but what you're doing is, is completely conflicting. So like, do you actually want what you say you want? And are you willing to make some changes to get, try a different strategy to get what you say you actually want? I think my issue is I just have a very specific physical archetype. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, but it also, it goes back to, it's not for me, I mean, like, it's 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 not fully uh, an aesthetic thing. It's it's going back to, like, what I was saying about, like, my mom and stuff. It's, like, very, it's it's it has been hard for me to, um, like, bond, like, create, like, a bond mm-hmm. with with others. Like, I, you know, I, I, I date, I've, I have, I've had relationships that have lasted a couple months and they're great. We have um, intimacy, uh, but at the end of the day, like I just don't. Um, yeah, there, it's not. It doesn't create like this, like this solid, um, enduring mm-hmm. bond for me. Have you ever looked at the ways that you like your deactivating strategies? With my deactivating strategies. So it's what avoidantly atta- attached people do is when. They can get excited about someone and usually like I'd say around the three month mark, that excitement starts to wane and then Mm. you start noticing imperfections and then the imperfection becomes the main focus of why they're not the right person. Um, I've in the past used my ex-girlfriend as an excuse. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I would say I haven't. It it wasn't just an excuse. It was it was truth. It was reality. Um, But yeah, I've um, in the past, I would I would just I would just detach Mm-hmm. And then that would become sort of like a ghosting thing. Yeah. And that this is like the distant past. I've I'm I've gotten way better. I'm way more honest and upfront and transparent about, you know, my intentions and my my struggles mm-hmm. with whoever it is I'm dating these days. Yeah. Therapy has helped a lot with that. Yeah. So yeah, basically with deactivating strategies, they're typically um you're not conscious that you're doing them. Um and they are ways of sabotaging intimacy or avoiding it and they come up in different ways they could be like after the three month mark you're like oh you find you find reasons why they're not the right perfect fit and then you end it with them or um we can also try to date people with an unavailable future uh or date people who are long distance like you have a tendency to want long distance or Hmm. Maybe um, someone that is from your past and like that always, as long as you have that person from your past in your heart space, no one can ever get too close. But it's all, these are all ways of how we avoid intimacy. Wow. Yeah, that's super interesting. I'm trying to think if there's like a common commonality for me, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think for a long time it was just like getting, clearing the space, like Palo Santoing or whatever my, (laughs) my heart chakra, like (laughs) <laughs> whatever my more spiritually uh inclined friends you know like we the, but like whatever making space yeah like because for a long time i was like holding space for this this one person and uh it didn't pan out so um but yeah i don't know i think it's uh 
this is um there's a lot to think about here yeah i used to only date unavailable men hmm. and i would be like big in new york all the guys are unavailable blah 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 emotionally unavailable yeah or, like, or even physically unavailable wow. like if they lived in a different um city like across like in california i'm like yes ding 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 but i didn't know this right i would just choose these people and then it would have the same result and i and i always said like i want a relationship and i was single for five years and i was like well hmm, like what's going on here and i realized that by chasing unavailable people, it was a great way of avoiding intimacy and never getting too close to anyone and be and never really being vulnerable. Hmm. And I still like have a hard time with vulnerability, even though I veer a bit more anxiously attached. Like it's harder for me to really let someone in, whether they're friends or romantic partners. Um, and so when I recognize that, I just noticed like it was easier for me to choose unavailable people and then blame it on them than look internally and be like, what, why am I doing this? Interesting. Yeah. Vulnerability is a big, is a big thing. And I think vulnerability like looks different for men than mm -hmm. it does for women. Or I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Do you, is that? Well, how does it look like for you? Uh, man, I, I see, I don't know because I think that I'm vulnerable. Okay. I would, I would, have always described myself as, as a vulnerable person because I treat my, I, I, I present like an open book. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I try to be as upfront as I can be about my past. Um, I've made myself an open book publicly. Like I talk about things, you know, on my podcast that are, that are personal. Um, in do the, you receive help? Do I receive help? Are you comfortable with letting people do things for you, helping you, giving you favors? Yeah. You are? That's right? I think so. Um yeah. I think I think I am. Cuz it's very it's vulnerable to receive. And so typically people who struggle with vulnerability, yeah. Um sometimes they will also they'll give a lot because it actually helps them stay in control. I think that <laughs> I think that in relationships it might seem as though I'm not being vulnerable, okay. but that's only because you can't it's only because when like you know if i if i don't actually feel something for another person i can't fake that yeah um and so that's the thing is that normally like in 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 many relationships you know i don't i don't actually like feel so i i want sexually mm -hmm. there are things that i want from from right. the other person um but uh but creating the bond like because of the the avoidant bonding style that i've seemingly inherited um, it's made it hard to actually like feel a, a connection. So I can't fake that. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I'm shrouding the way that I feel. Yeah. I'm, I, I think that I'm being vulnerable in the sense that I'm being honest. I'm being, uh, to me, that's what vulnerability is mm -hmm. being honest and truthful. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, but, I, but I've, I've been in relationships where I've received that, you know, girls would be like, you, you know, you have like vulnerability issues. Mm. Mm. Some girl made me read David data. Okay. <laughs> Way of the Superior Man. Yeah, uh -huh. that was a, actually a good book. Were yeah. you are you into that? I like it. I I, I think that his framework uh, can be helpful, especially because I work with a lot of women who um, they're highly successful and they've had to create a lot of habits of overcompensating in the workforce. So like veering very very masculine, very like or aggressive. I mean, I used to do that and that's not their natural energy state. And so they apply this at work and then they don't turn it off. And then they're with partners or they attract people who then become more of the feminine energy state with them. And then they get mad about it. Wow. But for men, probably a good book. I mean, it was actually recommended to me by a woman who said that she derived a lot of value from it, but, um, but yeah, probably a good book for for dudes, I don't know, um, who are who are who feel that they are struggling with vulnerability, uh, check it out. Um, what's next for you? You said you're writing on a, you're working on a new book about dating. Yeah, it's very very new. Um, it's going to be on like the science and spirituality of dating, so like actually like research back tools to help people wow. um, become really good at dating and to the point of like wanting a to, to get a relationship. 
Um, so yeah, but it's, it's in the works. So cool. Yeah. I actually thought that this would be a good business model. I don't know if you'll take it, uh, you know, it's, a uh, cause online dating to me, it's very time consuming. It's, it's tedious. As I mentioned, I would love to just be able to like, let somebody else represent me online mm -hmm. just to set me up to bat for that in-person date. Mm -hmm. So like an executive assistant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To, to do the online dating thing for me, set me up with the dates. So that I don't have to do it. I feel like that's, there's a business model in there. Well, there's matchmakers. Oh. <laughs> do you, are, do those work? Um, they they do work. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I've done it before, but you have. Yeah, like, but I would meet like really nice guys, but just wasn't my wow my thing. I like I think that look in the prospecting, the very, very top. Do whatever, whether it's a combination online, in person, um, meetup group, whatever it is to get enough of prospecting and then, you know, filter out, um, you know, to go lower on, into the funnel. Sur also, I've heard you say surround yourself with high safety people. Oh, yeah. What is that? What does that mean? Um, so the the people we're exposed to on a regular basis are, are wiring us, right? Our nervous systems, our neural pathways for trust and healthy connection. And it's not so much the people that you actually like, it's who are you actually physically exposed to? It could be your roommate, it could be your coworker. And if you are the 10 people you're around, if a lot of them are people who are low safety, so you feel judged, you feel on edge, you have to be hyper vigilant for like your security, your nervous system is constantly going to be in a state of like anxiety or hypervigilance. It's not in, um, you know, this calm state, which is called your window of tolerance. Mm. And so they're, they're literally wiring you. So when I'm working with people who especially veer more anxious and they want a relationship, I say like, look, you need to first get your, your house in order. Like who, who's your tribe and start being mindful of the low safety people and decreasing your exposure to them. And then looking at high safety, and if you don't find some, and increasing your exposure to those people. So that might mean like, oh, in your group, there's like five of them are very high safety, but you see them once a month. Well, consciously make more effort to be exposed to them a bit more. And once you've got that in order, eventually your nervous system really calms down and you build those necessary neural pathways for, for trust. Um, and that helps you in your foundation for actually in ro romantic partnerships. Wow. So would that mean potentially defriending people? Yes. IRL, but like friend, yeah. people who are low safety in, in your real life? Yeah, because you're constantly on a survival state. Wow. Right? Like it's, if you actually look at it, you're in this, this kind of, um, your body's trying to protect itself. So you are probably have adrenaline and cortisol and yeah. you're like, oh my God, I have to be on edge. And um, that's just, when you kind of get rid of that, man, life gets so much better. <laughs> Yeah, because it's like you are the average of whatever the five or whatever so people that you hang out with most. Yeah. I feel very lucky. All of my friends are high safety people. Great. Yeah. Yeah. People that, um, how can you, uh, what are some ways to identify low safety people? Scarcity mindset. I actually have like a worksheet with like a bunch of, of like questions. Um, but yeah, certain things like how, it's a lot on how you feel, right? Mm. Because they might have good intentions, but the result is is like terrible. Yeah. So if you feel judged around them, if you feel like you can't voice your opinion, um, if you feel like you can't be yourself is a really huge one. Like you have to edit yourself in order to gain their approval. If they're hypercritical of you, those are all signs that they are low safety people. I feel like people also have, um, not now. All, all I feel like I'm, I'm very grateful. All my friends, my, I have a strong community in in here in LA. All my friends are, are very high safety people. But in the past, I experienced people who um, maybe project these very like subtle limiting beliefs onto you. Mm. Um, they see you a certain way, and they refuse to see you as any yeah. other way than the limited way in which they see you. And that can be a constraint. That can For be very sure. constrictive. Yeah. Especially if you end up believing what they believe and then you're like, oh, yeah, I can't do that. I can't write a book. Yeah. Like, you know, the percentage of people that can actually get a published book is so small. You're right. Like, so you have to be so careful with that. Yeah. I like to think that you don't owe who you were yesterday or last week or last month or last year anything. You can be you are free to be somebody completely new today, tomorrow. But in tandem with that, you don't owe the perception that your friends have of you, right. anything either. Yeah. 
It's just that sometimes your friends want you to be a certain way. Maybe they've chosen you as a friend for, you know, self-serving purposes and, and you show up a certain way in their lives and they refuse to think of you any differently, but... Yeah, well, there's like, we all have a homeostasis, right? Like we like familiarity because it's safe for us. We like what we can predict. And so if suddenly you decide like you, I don't know, go to therapy and then the Hoffman process and you come back and you do ayahuasca and then you're like, you know what? I'm going to pursue my dreams. I'm going to like state my boundaries. And then suddenly you're the people who've known you the longest. Like, what the hell is this? Like, this is way unpredictable. And it creates psychic tension in them. Yeah. And so they don't want you to be this new you, even if it's helpful for you. And they don't, they can't explain why. Wow. And so they might put you down or whatever. And it, again, it's not because they're evil, but they're so uncomfortable with it because it's knocking them out of their homeostasis. Yeah, it's sort of like, I mean, I feel like many of my listeners will relate to this. It's sort of like if you have friends that you eat with a lot and uh, and they order, you know, something unhealthy, like a fast food meal or whatever, and, and you, in the past, were right there with them ordering the fast food meal, but then you decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to have a salad. Yeah. And instead of the regular soda, I'm going to have a diet soda or maybe be even better, a glass of water with that. And then they, they look at you weird like, oh, yeah. somebody's on. Yeah, they just make a, it could be very subtle like yeah. that, but it makes you feel weird. And then it makes, because it's made them uncomfortable, mm -hmm. it puts that that tension there yeah. in the relationship yeah. with food. And so like with these relationships, right? Like not everyone needs to be cut out, but there are certain people that you need to do an honest assessment and say like, um, can I actually have an honest conversation with this person, say with boundaries or, you know, when they, when they're critical of my dreams, like I feel this way and I, like, I don't want that anymore. And you, there are some people that you can salvage by actually having a conversation, by telling them what your boundaries and needs are and giving them an opportunity so that you can shift the dynamic. And I know for myself, I, I used to have these old friends that like, I was always like the brunt of the jokes, like they would make fun of me and I just played along with it. And as I got older, I was like, I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> so I would see my friends um, and they would do the same thing. And I just stopped them like, hey, like, I don't think it's funny. And I don't want to be made fun of that way. And it was a little bit awkward. And I had to reinforce a boundary like the second and third time. But now the dynamics completely changed. They, they don't make fun of me anymore. I love that. Boundary, <laughs> boundaries are so important. Yeah. So important. Yeah. There's like a meme. I don't know. There was a meme that I saw about boundaries and it was like really good. Um, but yeah, they are super important. It's good to have boundaries. Well, this was so fun. Love talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I want to keep going. I but, know. Um, <laughs> well, what are you going to do differently in dating? Okay. Like what did you learn? Is there one thing you learned that you're going to do a little bit differently? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I guess I'm going to be more, um, I guess forgiving of the, uh, te the tediousness of it. I'm going to think of it like getting a visa or getting my passport renewed or whatever, because I want to go to Bali. Yes. <laughs> Bali's great. Yeah. Bali's great. Um, and, uh, and the, and the process in general, not just online dating, but like, you know, the, 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 the whole process. I generally, here's the thing. I don't actually, it's not that big of a, it's not that big of a drain on me because I don't really prioritize it also. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm very focused on work, yeah. creativity, my family life, with my brothers, my, my community, my friends. So for me, dating, it's not a, it's not like there's a void in my life that feel that, that needs filling. Like mm -hmm. I've got, my life feels very rich. And yeah. so that's actually maybe uh, both a blessing and a curse mm -hmm. because it's, it's made dating at times feel almost irrelevant because mm -hmm. I've got all these amazing friends that I'm intimate with, right. not sexually intimate, but like yeah. intimate in the sense that like we, we travel together and we share, you know, like funny, you know, bonding experiences together. Um, but, uh, but no, I do want to, I do want to prioritize it more. So something I would recommend for you, because I work with a lot of people who are very, very busy. Mm. Um, you can actually just like schedule time and it could be 25 minutes and that's it. Once a week you do 25 minutes and that's when you like go through the sorting of the apps uh, and where you're matching. And then if you meet someone on there like, oh, like that's actually interesting, then yes, you might need to go back to like start messaging. But then your actual like trying to meet new people on the apps is only in within that time. And you have it, you do it, you know, your once a week thing, then you are consciously 
you know, taking action to, you know, get closer to this goal that you want, which is eventually a relationship. What's the most efficient date? Is it like coffee? Do women see coffee dates as being like a, like a weird, friendly, non-intimate? Yes. Yeah. Like is a coffee date, like what, is it lame to suggest a coffee date? Or does every date have to be like, let's get a drink or let's get, I will, ne I never do dinner on a first date. Yeah, no, dinner is no bueno. No, just like drink. And it doesn't have to be alcohol, but like, yeah. I'll be like. Green juice. A green juice. De during the day? Sure. Does do does day dating work in this? Um, I I mean I, guess I think it depends on the person. Yeah, it depends, right? Like I mean, if you meet someone that could be an amazing match, it could be fucking eleven in the afternoon. It'll be great. Yeah. Um, sure. if it's not that amazing, yeah, you have to be so strategic in all these things. I'm so terrible. I once remember I wasn't that excited about going on a date with someone. I'm like, let's get ice cream because I'm like the ice cream will me eventually <laughs> melt, and there is a time period. Wow. Um. Yeah. But okay. So See, look, I saw that as like a great, great, great way to date. A way. <laughs> so the way that you want to do a date, if you want. Look, I'm not talking about someone you're totally not excited about, but say there's someone you met online. You're like, okay, you like this good banter. Like, I'm excited to see this person. You want to start off somewhere where it's like not a big obligation. So whether that is a coffee or a green juice or a mimosa, whatever it is. Um, but in that period of time of 30 minutes or 45 minutes, you can tell, is there enough connection here? Are we having fun? And if it's going well, then you can be like, hey, like, um, are you are you hungry? Do you want to go for a bite? And then you'll see how they react. And then yeah. if so, then you go to the next place. And if it goes well, what you want to do is go to different places. So by you going to like the drink place and then um, a place for, for dinner and then this other place for a cool dessert, the movement creates momentum. Um, and there's something called the excitation transfer where like the excitement of the environment actually transfers onto your feelings for that person. So you actually feel like it kind of gives you a little bit of a boost where because there's all this movement, it's fun and there's novelty, you will actually leave that date thinking uh, like you're a bit more drawn to the person. Now, the next tip is you want to end the date on a high. So just like the Disneyland analogy, huh. don't end the day where it's like you're exhausted and it's like nine no, no, hours. Like <laughs> you want to end it like maybe you've gone to a couple spots. Maybe it's four hours, five hours. But like when it's going great and you're like so excited, like don't drag it out till the end. Be like, OK, this was great. And then, yeah, then you can set up the second time. But what that does is the time in between when you ended that date to the next date, there's like this there's this excitement because you want more. Yeah, leave them wanting more. Yes. Yeah. Don't overstay your welcome. <laughs> yes. Actually, that that reminds me of something else that I that I picked up from you. Um, future tripping. Oh yeah. So I do this sometimes when I do make a match on one of these dating apps, and I think the girl's really hot, and I start envisioning because again I'm visual, I'm very visual. So as I start like envisioning like trips and all the like the future things that we could do, and then. Because at least on, you know, this one app that uh, I've been on for a while, um, there's a lot of window shopping, as I mentioned. You don't you don't often get a response. A lot of a lot of girls actually not to I mean, just to be uh, fair, they're probably in relationships and they just keep the, they just keep their accounts open like on this app. It's not like, you know, there's like this annoying sort of like social status of being on the app. I'm literally just on it because I've grandfathered it. Grandfather didn't I get it for free. We know, we know. Yeah. That's why he's on Maya. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, but but sometimes they won't respond. And so, uh, but I've made this a match with like this, you know, like a, attractive girl. And in my brain, I'm for the first 24 hours, because I've made the match, I'm like future tripping, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, my brain is taking me on this journey with her as a partner. And, uh, and then when they don't respond, I'm like. The montage goes. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I see this a lot when people are dating and basically what future tripping is, is like you go on a date and it's it's great. And then during the date, they mention they like Bali and then you go home and then in your head, you're like, you know, like we could have a farm in Bali and have green <laughs> juices and this yoga excursion. And then by the time you go on the second date, like say five days later, um, that person is just going on their second date with you. So their liking level of you is like, 
equivalent to someone who's going on a second date. Are they and not doing the same thing though? Fantasizing and not if you have the tools. Not after listening to this podcast, you're not <laughs> gonna do it. Right. But the person who's future tripping has lived three lifetimes with this person. And so you're feeling skyrocket, right? Because also when you're doing that thinking, there's also chemicals that are happening. Wow. Right. You're getting the dopamine, you're feeling it, you're like, oh my God. And you're your body can't tell the difference between what's happened in the past, present, and the future. So when you're marinating in this fantasy that you've, you know, had this avocado farm in Bali, um, by the second day, your feelings are just, they're on a chemical level, on an emotional level, they're way higher. So you can come across in a way where the other person might be like, oh, it's very intense or like it's a bit needy or yeah. a bit conquesty. And you leave the date thinking like, oh my God, it's great. And they're like, oh, that something was off. And they, you don't know why, um, but it's probably because they had this intense energy that didn't match where the date was. I've felt that. Yeah, I've been on the receiving end of that, but then I've also been guilty of doing it myself. Ditto. So what's the solution then? When we find ourselves future tripping, Yeah. Uh, pivoting right away? So like yeah, whether you're future tripping, which is mean you're in your brain about the future or you're ruminating the past, you can do the same thing. So one exercise is the stop sign exercise where um, first you acknowledge like, oh, what's happening? So like, oh, I'm actually making up stories right now that are not grounded in reality. Then you close your eyes, you imagine a big red stop sign, and then you say the word out loud, stop. Then you look, open your eyes and you look around, you just start looking and labeling everything you're grateful for and why like, oh, I'm grateful for this tree and the sunlight because it's so beautiful outside and you keep going. So it's a way of redirecting your thought. Um, and the first few times you do it, you might be like, this doesn't work. But again, like if you keep practicing it, um, eventually it's like, instead of going like squirrel and you're like off on this runaway train to Bali, you're like, you're, you will lose your thought because you get back grounded into the present and it really, really works. Wow. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. You feel smaller when you're in the presence of something vast and indescribable. And when you feel smaller, so does your chatter. So experiencing awe, it's like the ultimate perspective broadener.